Trailer to Breakthrough. I'm Dr. Debbie Silber, and today's guest is Jason Holzer. Growing up in Taos, Missouri, Jason was raised in a small town with a loving family that gave him every chance to succeed. His parents were supportive and provided everything this 17-year-old could ever want. That is, until his life changed forever on May 8, 2003, when his dad unexpectedly passed away by suicide, leaving him, his mother, and two younger sisters behind. Through hard work, dedication, and a strong faith in God, he is now a certified teacher and thought coach, accomplished basketball coach, an elite skills trainer, Amazon bestselling author, and transformational storyteller, speaker. So, how do you turn trauma into transformation? My next guest, Jason Holzer, is going to be talking about just that. When his father took his own life when Jason was 17, it left him with lots of questions and lots to heal from. If you know anyone who's been impacted by suicide, please share this episode. You're going to really get a lot out of it. Here's Jason. Okay, everybody, you're going to love this episode. I'm going to be speaking with Jason Holzer today, and we're talking about post-traumatic growth. What is it? How do you move through it? How do you know if you've experienced post-traumatic growth? And he's going to share an amazing story, too. So welcome, Jason. Hey, thanks, Debbie. Thanks for having me on here today. Absolutely. So let's just get started. If you can explain, I'd love to hear your definition of post-traumatic growth. What does it mean to you? Yeah, so um, to me, post-traumatic growth means that you've experienced some sort of, of altering trauma in your life where your life has been completely flipped upside down, but through resilience, perseverance, faith, you have found a way to turn that negative, devastating circumstance into a positive, inspiring circumstance as you move forward. You know, and I love how you said, you know, you found a way to do that. And here's the thing, we always have that choice. Post-traumatic growth is, is not a guarantee. We work towards it. It is a choice because there are so many people, and you and I both know this, I'm sure, where you know, there are people who go through something traumatic and that's where they stay. They stay in that, in that story and that wasn't the case for you. So can you, can you just get started with sharing a bit about your story so we see uh, you know, what, what the before was and then you could explain the after. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, whenever, I was, uh, whenever I was 17, um, right before the end of my school year, my junior year in high school, I actually lost my dad to suicide. Um, and it was something that I never expected to happen. You know, my dad was a very uh, involved father. My parents were together for over 20 years. Like, you know, on the external, you would have never guessed him that would happen to him. Um, but, uh, you know, the day that it happened, I remember um, feeling like I knew that he passed away before. You know, I actually found out, but I, whenever I found out how he passed away, I was really confused and overwhelmed and almost felt some, some level of guilt and shame. Like there was something that I could have done differently to where he would have valued his life. Like almost like I was part of the, the problem, you know, and I wasn't, a, I wasn't a kid that ever like caused, like, you know, I, I, I went to work, I went to school, I was doing all the right things, you know, but it was still that inner feeling of like, was it me? Did I do something? You know, like, um, so that's kind of how it transpired into my adulthood too. Like trying to figure out those, those tough emotions of what the heck happened and how did it get to that point? You know, and, and first of all, I'm so sorry for your loss. And, and suicide is one of those things where many people I know who, who have experienced that on some level, they can look at it as a betrayal. Because in addition to the loss, and there's such intense confusion. Because when, when you lose someone you love, you know, there, there, certainly there's that grieving, that mourning, that loss. But there doesn't necessarily have to be all of those questions. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot more complexities. Like, why, why did he choose to do that? Like, I felt abandoned in a lot of ways. Abandoned, betrayal, I think, are synonymous, in, you know. Um, and I know my mom felt some of that betrayal as well because, you know, as a, as a spouse, she would think like, hey, I should know everything going on. And so I think she felt maybe even, I would say, a small amount of embarrassment because like, you know, like you almost feel like I, maybe I didn't know him as well as what I thought I did, you know? And so uh, we really had to work through that together. Like, no, mom, like, you know, I, I, I was telling like, unfortunately, we, we, like he made a choice that we had no control over, quite frankly. Um, and I and think you that's know, what we have and to understand. 
Right. And, and I want to stop you there because that's something that's so typical to betrayal. You know, it's that shock of how did I not know? How did I not see? How did I have no indication that anything like this was happening? And that very feeling is what has us questioning ourselves, questioning our judgment, questioning our sanity, questioning all of it. So what was, what was the meaning that you made of that? Did you, you know, and you mentioned like you were asking yourself a, a bunch of questions, but what did you, what did it lead towards? Did you think like, did I do something? Was it, you know, I mean, I, I don't, what did it? Yeah. It led, like, it led to a lot of like reflection on my own and like, was there something that I just wasn't noticing? Was there something that, you know, cause I was 17 at the time, you know, as 17 year olds, like we kind of have our own like blinders on like kind of on our own, own little perspective. Like we're, you know, I was in the habit of going to school, going to work, coming home, talking to my parents a little bit, and then having homework to do. And then we're, I, I was just kind of on autopilot, you know, and then mm. it made me really reflect. I was like, dang it, what if I would have just said I loved him more? What if I would have just gave him a hug? Or what if I would have just told him, you know, man, dad, thank you. You know, if I would just, you know, if I would just done those things a little bit more, would that have made a difference? And, you know, I, I don't know if it would have or not. And I've learned not to beat myself up over that because the reality of it is I can't change anything. But I think what it has done is made me realize, like, maybe I should tell people more about how much I care about them in the present while they're still with me right now. So maybe that might prevent it from happening in the future. Well, and that's what leads to the post-traumatic growth. You know, I, I, I look at post-traumatic growth as sort of the, the upside, the new insight, the new awareness, the new perspective that you have because of something traumatic. And it sounds like making sure you let everybody know uh, you love them is a is a great uh, you know outcome of something traumatic. So tell us, walk us through. So here's this traumatic event, and you're sort of coming to this realization of okay, I I, I want to heal from this. What were some of the things that you did? What did it lead to? Bring us up to date. Like walk yeah, us through yeah. that process. Uh, man, the first thing I did was. Um you know, I just kind of gave myself time. Like I, mm -hmm. uh, I used that summer and I, I really like tried to, like my friends were, were a huge help. Like at the beginning, like I had a great group of high school friends that, you know, they were just kind of there for me. Like, you know, they would just take me places. Like we would go to baseball games. We would go camping. Like it was right before, like go to the lake, you know, whatever, uh, just to kind of get away from it for a little while, you know, and then going into my senior year as well, I got involved with really more involved with young life, which is a, uh, a great organization that college kids come and they mentor high school kids. Um, they have a passion for making an impact. And, you know, there was a couple of guys there that really just, you know, whenever I had tough situations going on, they just listened. They didn't try to give me advice. Cause like, like Jason, I've never, I don't, I can't relate to you, but I can listen, you know? And so that was a great example for me. And then when I went to college, I met my wife at the very end of it. And you know, she's been, uh, you know, somebody like, you know, we've been married for almost seven years now, been together for over 10 and just like, she's the perfect person to help me through <clears throat> that situation because she's been so understanding throughout the whole process. Like whenever I have tough days or when, you know, his anniversary comes up when he passed away, she's, she's there for me. She's like, Hey, if you're having a tough day today, I understand. Mm -hmm. um, just let me know what, how I can help, you. you know? And so her empathy throughout all of this as well has been really helping me like push forward and what I want to do with this suicide prevention stuff as well because of her support. You know, you said so many things. I'm sitting here taking, taking notes about how I love, I love what that, that uh, those guys said to you, I can't relate to you, but I can listen. I mean, isn't that so wonderful? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's true. If someone, and I think so often people don't know what to say, so they don't say anything. And I remember this from when my mom passed years ago, it was the, you know, it was the time I needed my friends the most and people were so uncomfortable or felt so awkward. And that's what taught me. I remember back then, and now it's 23 years. I remember saying to myself, even if I don't know what to say, I'd rather stand there like a babbling idiot saying, I don't know what the heck to say to you, but I just, I'm here because yeah. that at least shows that you're there. And I, I love what, what they said. And, and empathy is so crucial too. So, th so that led you to get more involved in suicide prevention? Yeah, because I just like, well, um, I, I really studied a lot of personal growth stuff as well, a lot of, of self-help books, a lot of like, how do you set yourself up for success? And, you know, one of the things I learned is, you know, sometimes your past can be little 
indications of what you're maybe supposed to be doing in your future, you know, whether it be your most euphoric moments where you just felt like things just flowed and everything like just fell perfectly or your most painful moments where, you know, something happened that completely altered your life. And so for me, both of those things were sports and then losing my dad to suicide. And so I was like, okay, maybe those are hints on, you know, what I should be doing. And I felt like, you know, with suicide trending the wrong direction in our society, maybe my story can, you know, save at least one person's life or, you know, maybe people like will rethink about, you know, valuing the life more because they see what a suicide loss survivor, all the, com the, the complex emotions and, and the things that they have to really battle, um, you know, so that was kind of my goal in, in getting into, into suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. And I want to get more into that too, but I know you mentioned, uh, I was looking at our notes, how spirituality played a big role and forgiveness. Tell me about that. Yeah, you know, I grew up um, Catholic and I, and I still attend a Catholic church, but I see spirituality as more than just religion. I see it as our identity. Um, like we, I believe we are a spirit having a human experience. And when you understand like, you know, in my opinion, God's spirit is perfect. And we actually have perfection within us whenever we understand how we're truly made, like we're using our intuition, our perception, um, our memory, those things that we're given um, and how to, how to apply those, then, uh, well, let me ask you this, Debbie, have you ever been uh, in a moment in life where everything you did just kind of worked out perfectly? Have you ever had that experience? Flow, yes. Yeah, flow, it's... yeah, exactly. Like, you know, you're writing something out or, you know, like, it's almost like an airplane going off and like it takes a lot of energy to get there but when you're soaring in the sky it's just like free and easy um that's kind of what I feel effortless like. it's it's yeah. a beautiful feeling it's it's it is. you know i remember it's so it's so interesting that you say that because i actually feel that when i'm when i'm coaching within our community or when i'm speaking often but i remember um it was a thanksgiving dinner and and i do thanksgiving for it was about 25 people and i made everything and it was just there was something so easy about it and it was I wasn't, I wasn't in my head. I was completely in my heart, just giving and serving and having the most wonderful day with people I loved. And it was complete and total flow. And it felt like two minutes and it was an entire day. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's kind of how I try to like give people to understand what I mean by spirituality is like when you're in the moment and things just naturally progress how they're supposed to, like, you don't have to feel like you're like working super hard. You don't have to feel like you're and that. And that's a lot of problem too, is, you know, if you think about jobs, 86%, 83% of people don't like what they do. And that's why they, we, we have such a job issue. You know what I mean? Like, so one out of six people want to like what they do. Like, that's a problem. You know, that's what's causing a lot of this stress, a lot of this, you know, maybe depression or because people aren't doing what they think they're meant to be doing. Mm -hmm. But they're afraid to try it though, because they feel like they have to, you know, stay in this mold of, well, I've done this for so long. What, how do I transition? And so it's like taking that leap of faith of like, well, maybe this will be better if I let this go. But it's, and, it's having that, that faith to do that, though. Well, and that's it. And it's having the, the courage to do that, too. And here's where I find trauma is the greatest catalyst to change. Because we could be, let's say, going you know, in some direction as far as a job because we think that's what our parents wanted us to do or that's what we should do. And then I found you know, in, in doing this work that it takes that illness, crisis, tragedy, trauma to shake us up, wake us up and have us saying, what the heck? I don't even like this. What am I doing? And that's where we can switch gears and, and do what's completely and totally on purpose for us. So it sounds yeah. like that's what you're speaking to. Talk to us about forgiveness. Um, forgiveness is, you know, a lot of people see forgiveness as it's what you do for the other person. But the reality of it is forgiveness is what you do for yourself. You know, and uh, I have a, an exercise I do called continuous forgiveness, where there's a lot of times in the year that that might trigger an emotion like, uh, for example, my kids' birthdays or my parents' anniversary, the day of my dad's birthday. You know, just those like, you know, calendar moments. And I say, dad, man, I really wish you were here to celebrate your grandkids' birthday. Uh, I forgive you though. Like you, you, you feel, you, you allow yourself to feel the, the, the emotion of maybe there's a little bit of resentment anger, but then you let it go. It's like, like clouds passing through the sky. You know, sometimes you're going to have those dark clouds, gray clouds, but forgiveness is like the sun, like just shining through that darkness and just letting it go and not getting too emotionally wrapped up in them. But but being aware that they're there. 
You know, and I love that you're bringing that up too, because it's when we deny that feeling, it stays. Sometimes it just needs to be acknowledged to be released, you know, and it's, uh, and, and by giving it, giving it just that space, you, it could be heard, understood, you, you've processed it, off it goes. And I, I love, I love that idea of continuous forgiveness because it is, it is a process. And I know even just in the betrayal world, we forgive, we take it back, we forgive, we take it back, but it's, you know, until we're, we're truly, we're truly ready, but forgiveness has nothing to do with the other person. It is completely about us. Yeah, and I, and I don't mean like, you know, you should just kind of like let people walk all over you after you forgive them. Like you should definitely like, you know, stand up for yourself. And, you know, I'm not saying like forgiveness is a is a pathway to just allow people to come and go as you want, but it's not allowing what happened to affect your day-to-day life. Absolutely. So talk to us again, about, you know, go into it a little bit more about what you're doing as far as suicide prevention to help other people. I'd love to know more yeah. about that. You know, actually, uh, just recently, I am a uh, went to a certified thought coaching program um, where, you know, I'm working with people and learning how to rewire their thinking and and, and, and finding their the origin of some of the thoughts that they're having. Because we have like 70,000 thoughts in a day, and 90% of those thoughts are repeated from the day before. And if it's a negative thought, it's 40 to 70, 40 to 70 times more powerful than a positive thought. Isn't just that awful? Of, Here we can have something so great yeah. happen to us and we focus on the one thing, right? The, the, the on one. The eight, yeah. <sighs> but so it's like understanding like, hey, maybe that thought wasn't really originated from you. It was somebody that somebody said that you got emotionally involved in. And so helping them understand that your thoughts become your feelings, your feelings become your actions, your actions become your reactions and understand that process. Then we can help replace those, those negative thoughts with, with empowering thoughts uh, by asking again the right questions. And then getting them aligned with their actions based off of the thoughts they really want to have. Is you know, there a process you work people through to do that? If you could share yeah. what the, like some sort yeah. of process is, I'd love that. It's it's uh, called the says who method, and so basically it's from a lady named Orin Adridge, which I can connect you with because she would be a great guest on your podcast as well. Thank you. Um, but you know, there's seven says who questions that kind of align yourself like with like, do I like this thought? Is this thought working for me? You know, questions like that to really get you a, like mindful, get you aware of your thoughts. And then there's a like repeal and replace. So meaning like you, you pull, it's almost like layers of onion. You pull it back you know, or like pulling out, pulling out a weed from a garden. Like you take out that, like that negative thoughts like that weed. You pull it out so you open the space to implant a powerful thought. And then we have a thought, al- like a, a, a goal alignment where you align your thoughts with little action steps you can take. Maybe like two or three things that you can do to just mm-hmm. get yourself in the right moment, to just start seeing yourself getting, in, like doing and applying the thoughts that you want to have, mm-hmm. you know? So it is a very structured, broken down system, coaching system that, you know, you can work people through. And it's, you know, it's the, the four pillars of life. It's your career, it's your finances, it's your health, it's your relationships. You know, mm-hmm. those are the four things that we focus on. That's so, that's so great. And I love the structure of it because with that structure, it's just, you know, it's something you can, you can look at, you can identify and say, Oh, I have this really, this, this negative belief that's totally not serving me working through those seven questions, repeal and replace and the, uh, and goal alignment. That's wonderful. So how do you know if you've experienced post-traumatic growth? What does it feel like? Um, for me, it feels like th- things start to work in your favor. Like, and, and that, that sounds really simple, but I mean, um, like, and, and like you would go back early, like you make the choice that today is going to be my, the best day of my life. Like, doesn't matter what happens. I ask myself the questions like, why, why are, why is everything working in my favor? Like I ask myself like questions like that, like where, when things that may be challenging that happen, I'm like, Hey, what is this teaching me? So in the past, I was like, Oh God, this is tough. Like this hard, this is stuff. But like, again, it's that, that quick mind flip, like what skill do I need to develop to be good in this situation? You know, so that's kind of where I think you take challenges, you take things that happen because life is going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's just your perception of what this situation means. Um, you know, and so yeah. that's kind of where I feel like that's where post-traumatic growth, I, I kind of feel like you've gotten there whenever you have that kind of thought process. And I love that because it's so true. It really starts with a different set of questioning. Instead of the woe is me, why does this always happen to me? It's what can I extract from this? What can I learn from this? What can I do with this? And just even in the different line of questioning, you could see where you'd get such different answers. 
Mm -hmm. yeah because yeah, your, your your mind is a answer seeking mechanism and so it will find the answers regardless of what questions you ask yourself so you guys like oh why is this happening to me oh why why is life so hard well you're gonna find a, any reason why life is so hard yeah. like it, it, your, your your mind will find it on the opposite end man why does my life get easier as i get older why why do i have the right amount of people why do i build great relationships with people uh, why do i love my kids why do i love my spouse so much and you know, then, you can yeah, you can even feel the difference when you're asking yeah. those kind of questions and what yeah. it would lead to. It just to. puts you in a different positive vibration, and you you just get more excited about what you're doing. It doesn't matter what's on your plate. You know, if I ask myself the right question. Like one one question I ask myself is, why do I get so much done in such little time? Mm. You know, I to kind of give yourself the immunity of overwhelm, and then you keep asking it over and over again. You'll find your reasons why you get things done, and you feel more empowered. That's amazing. I love that. And it's really true. It's, and it really through repetition and consistency that just lays down a new belief. And then before you know mm -hmm. it, you're, you're really, that's, that's who you are. That's who you become. And that's post-traumatic growth. What do you want to make sure everyone knows as we wrap up? Well, especially with COVID going on, I think the main message to me is like, you know, give life a chance to get better. You know, it's going to get tough. Like you're going to go through some hard things eventually, but having that positive optimism, like, you know what? I'm sad today or you know what I'm going I'm going through some things right now but I know there's going to be some positive that's going to come from this if I choose to have the right mindset going into this now that's not always easy to do and it takes concentration it takes thought it takes willpower but if you can have that mindset and get to the other side of it and get to that light at the end of the tunnel you know you're going to be so glad you kept that mindset and I think it takes determination too it just takes the the, the willingness to say regardless of what comes my way, because stuff will, I'm just going to keep at this. And I, I also look at it like things come up to show us how committed we are to this sure. new way. Yeah. So something, mm -hmm. you know, there may be that roadblock and it's like, hmm, I'm going to see, you still want this? Let's see, get over that hurdle. You still want this? You know, let's just see. Jason, this was wonderful. Where do we go to learn more about you? Uh, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, as well as Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, I'm on a lot of social media forms. Um, you know, we also have a website called 4dathletes.com. To, you know, raise a generation of human consciousness on how we think and how we develop good habits. Jason, I'm going to ask you to repeat that. You totally cut out. I'm going to, I want to, we'll edit that out. And I just want you to, uh, we do that piece. I don't know. There's something going on with the Wi-Fi. Uh, Jason, okay. where, Jason, where do we go to learn more about you? Yeah. Um, go to Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, and also 4 dathletescom is the website I have, um, uh, it's where we teach essential life skills to sports. It's a new program that I'm launching with another coach, um, uh, to help young adults learn the, the right habits to, for them to be successful in whatever they do after they play sports. That's wonderful. Jason, I want to thank you so much. You are an example of post-traumatic growth. You know, stuff happens. We, we can't help it, but we can help what we do with it. So I know you shared so much uh, wisdom with everybody today and anybody who's struggling to, to uh, just, uh, you know, manage and come to, to terms and make some sense and meaning out of a suicide, you certainly help. So I just I pr appreciate you and, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Debbie, for having me. It's an honor to be on the show and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much. Jason shared so many important nuggets. I love the says who method, which are the seven questions that you use as a framework to rewire those negative beliefs. Stay in touch with Jason by going to his social media channels on Instagram at Holzer. And don't worry, we'll have all of his information in the show notes at the pbtinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Here's my biggest takeaway. I love that statement Jason's friend said, I can't relate to you, but I can listen. Sometimes when we're going through something challenging, that's all we want. We want to be heard and we want to know we're not alone during such a challenging time. So I'm going to keep that one in my arsenal and use it whenever I come across a situation that could use some empathy. 
even if I don't have the foggiest idea of how to help that person. Struggling with physical, mental, and emotional symptoms? Take the post-betrayal syndrome quiz, which you can find at the pbtinstitute.com forward slash quiz. And if you haven't already, check out the PBT Institute membership community. Imagine everything you'd ever need to become your physical, your mental, your emotional best community, support, certified coaches and practitioners you could schedule time with, daily classes on all kinds of interesting topics, curated experts teaching advanced strategies in the areas of health, mindset, spirituality, personal development. Imagine the most friendly, welcoming, and supportive place to become your best all online. Nothing like this exists, and I am so excited to welcome you. Just go to thepbtinstitute.com forward slash join to learn more. Thanks for listening. Can't wait to be with you next time, and here's to your breakthrough.